Hello gardeners and welcome to Native Plant Channel. I'm so excited today to be at Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, where we are going to be learning about native plants and building meadows. And I'm here with Dr. Leah Johnson, who is Associate Director of Landscape Stewardship and Ecology. Did I get that right? Land stewardship and Land ecology. Stewardship. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's a really long title. It's a long title. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to be showing you all facets of meadows, how to create your meadow, how to maintain your meadow, and the fantastic plants that you can use to build diversity into your home landscape. Dr. Johnson, could you please start us off with telling us about the meadow here at Longwood? I, I, actually, I just learned that the meadow has been around for 50 years, which is pretty spectacular. So like a lot of landscapes of the mid-Atlantic, this is a, a post and actually current agricultural landscape. Longwood Gardens, uh, the, the formal garden that people are more familiar with, is in the middle of 1,100 acres of land um, that includes forests and meadows and streams. Um, and agriculture uh, that is currently active. And so this part of the meadow garden that we're standing in right now um, began uh, to be managed instead of as like a, a hay field or pasture, they started adding native wildflowers to it about 50 years ago. Um, the new part of the meadow over this way uh, was part of the expansion and the creation of the meadow garden uh, which opened in 2014 and doubled the size of the meadow garden to 86 acres. Part of that was creating the trail system that uh, we're standing on right now. Um, we also installed uh, interpretive pavilions to introduce people to different aspects of the landscape. And we renovated a farmhouse way over there uh, to talk about the history of the land. So there were a few things involved in making the meadow garden. Fantastic. And guys, don't worry, you don't need 86 acres to do this. You can do this on way less. And Dr. Johnson is going to help you with that today and help you with how do you get started. Okay, so can you tell us how did this meadow begin? How did you start this off? So this meadow started as a hay field or a, a pasture. So um, it's a little bit different than starting with lawn, but not entirely different mm -hmm. um, because it's uh, that kind of system is dominated by um, European cool season grasses. Um, so in this case, because we we're working at a very large scale, um, we used herbicide um, in one treatment to, to remove the grasses so that we could plant native species. Um, the diversity of species that you see. Uh, some of that was already here and those seeds did come up. Um, we have uh, a rare, uh, for our region, uh, fire adapted grass that we have here called Andropogon gyrans that thrives in our meadow garden, which we do get to burn. Um, mm -hmm. Not recommended to do that in your own yard, <laughs> unless you want to file a lot of paperwork first. Um, uh, so after uh, making the area suitable for new seeds to germinate, we seeded the whole thing and, and then we used plugs in key spots. So in places where we wanted a little more oomph, we wanted some more flowers, um, we included plugs at um, the entrances and at the, in the interpretive pavilions and a few other spots throughout the meadow. Oh, fantastic. And gardeners, we all know that we're trying to avoid the use of all kinds of uh, pesticides. But sometimes you really have to resort to them, it's particularly when you have acres and you have acres of invasives, then you might have to resort, resort to a weed killer. Um, and then just you look at your end goal, right? So your end goal, you're going to plant a meadow that does provide a huge amount of biodiversity. But in order to get there, you might have to take that step to use um, a weed killer, even though you might not want to. Um, it's actually something we do research on here is we compare different kinds of approaches. So we might, co in, so for example, with managing invasive plants, um, we have trials going where we compare using chemicals, using hand pulling, um, using cutting at different timings to see what works best over the long term and what has a positive effect on the native plant community. So 
stay tuned. Uh, okay. <laughs> results from that research will be coming out in the next few oh, years. Oh, fantastic. So, and that's, an, that's something that as gardeners, sometimes we have a problem with is time and waiting and patience because these things don't happen overnight. And in order to conduct the right um, research and do the right thing, it takes time. It, it has does. to be, you need some <laughs> years in to figure out what's the best way to do things. Yes. Could you tell us for someone who has an, an average garden, doesn't have acres, what's the best way for them to get their meadow started? So it depends on what is happening on your soil already. If you're converting from lawn, which is something a lot of people are interested in, so you might be looking at the scale of like uh, a sidewalk strip um, or you know your yard, Although you can grow meadow plants in containers, and I highly recommend that. You can bring lots and lots of pollinators into your space with container plantings as well. But if you're, um, if you're working with lawn, um, I think it is a good idea to start small. Um, if you're working in a residential context, um, especially if you're doing it all yourself, there's a lot to learn. Um, so you can start with solarizing is one technique that people use where you take black plastic and a sheet and you stake it to the ground and you let the sun cook the plants you don't want. Um, you can also heavily mulch with cardboard. Um, each of these things takes different amounts of time to work and depending on what plants you have under there, some of them are more resistant to that than others. Okay. So would you say that if you're using um, cardboard or solarization that you should give that a about a year? Would you say that in the average situation that might be enough time? Probably a growing Probably season, a growing but it season. depends again on what plants you have under there. Have. Right, right. So maybe Japanese knotweed might not be as, <laughs> <laughs> as cooperative. You might need a big shovel. <laughs> Can you tell us about the plants that we see here in bloom and how they are helping the meadow? So here we have bee balm. Um, there are numerous species of bee balms, of monardas, uh, and they are great for pollinators. And what's one of the things that I love about them is that they offer value to wildlife in multiple seasons. So, you know, they offer nectar, they offer pollen to pollinators, and then they also have hollow stems, which is really important to overwintering pollinators. There are a whole lot of insects that um, are important that like to, basically they make a tiny hole in the stem of hollow stemmed plants. And and they lay their eggs in there and they overwinter. Oh, that's fantastic. And I know that for bees, that's one of the concerns as well, is that you not cut back everything to the ground at, at the end of the winter in order to keep your garden clean. You need to leave those stems standing for the bees and others to survive the winter. And this is one of the ones you can leave standing. Uh, you can kind of see, if you imagine all the flowers off, it's got this kind of little button of, uh, uh, what will be the, the seeds on the top, and that creates a nice winter texture as well. Another great plant uh, for multi-season awesomeness in meadows is Joe Pieweed, the Eutrochiums. There are, again, a few different ones of these, depending on which um, situation you're in for wetter or drier soils. Um, Eutrochium fistulosum, which means hollow stemmed. Again, another plant that's great for overwintering pollinators. You can leave the stems up over the winter. Um, also has great nectar uh, and pollen for pollinators. This one is just getting started. Um, we're right at the end of the middle of the season and going into the late season. So this is one of several species of asters. So species, these are species that have a whole lot of little flowers, a lot of them, um, ray flowers and disc flowers. And the you know, sort of late season meadow is really a party for asters. Native grasses are also a really important part of meadows and they offer different benefits from the, um, the things we tend to think of as flowers. Although they do have flowers, they're just really small. Um, and if you get a nice high magnification lens, you can appreciate the flowers of grasses, but you have to blow them up to really appreciate them. Um, little blue stem, Indian grass, these are two of the most abundant grasses in the meadow garden. Uh, these have great seeds, and seeds are super important for our overwintering birds um, and migratory birds as well. So you're providing bird food when you provide native grasses. Another great plant for meadows for pollinators are pycnanthemums, the mountain mints. They're not really from the mountains, but they are in the mint family. So uh, that means that they're chemically defended and herbivores don't like to eat them as much. 
Some of them seem to be slightly more palatable than others, uh, depending on how hungry your deer are. But mountain mints are great pollinator plants, um, and some of them also have hollow stems for overwintering pollinators. Another group of asters that get going in the late summer are the goldenrods. Um, Saldadego species. There again are a bunch of different species that are good in different situations and they also have these tiny flowers uh, that are beloved by the pollinators. Uh, they offer nectar, they offer pollen, and they're bright yellow so they make everything look very festive. When you're thinking about creating a meadow garden in your own space it's good to think about the size of the area that you have and the size of the plants that you want because you can have little short plants if that's the right thing for your space but you can also have sylphium perfoliatum if you want to a uh, cup plant this can be used as a visual screen <laughs> um, as well as being a great pollinator plant i'm surrounded by bees and they have really full pollen baskets on their legs and another interesting thing about sylphium is that it's actually fragrant which i um, discovered because I have it next to my deck and they're up high so I had the opportunity to smell them and they're actually fragrant so mm -hmm. if you have a deck that's elevated plant these by your deck and you'll get to enjoy them where you'll get to get to see them more at eye level and enjoy their fragrance. So one of the reasons to plant a really diverse meadow is to provide habitat for the maximum number of species that you can. And most insects are specialists, which means that they can only feed on a specific species or maybe a specific genus of plants. So they're limited in where they can get the resources that they need. So if you plant a diversity of species, you'll be supporting a greater diversity of pollinators as well. The design of Longwood's Meadow Garden incorporates a number of different values. So not only are we creating a landscape for biodiversity, but also for beauty, for inspiring people with the beauty of native plants and landscapes. Um, we're also protecting water quality. There's a stream that runs through this area that this is the headwaters for. It's also a beauty that is very much about surprise and change. Uh, it's about texture, it's about uh, being dynamic. If you go into a meadow twice, you're going to have a different experience each time. And that's really what uh, is really lovely and wonderful about natural systems generally, but meadows in particular are very dynamic systems. They're early successional systems, which means that they occur in nature only after a big disturbance. So that might be a fire, it might be a flood, uh, it might be some of, something else that kills off all the trees. In nature, meadows occur in places where trees can't grow or where, where trees are not growing right now um, for, for whatever reason. So you'll find them in high mountains, you'll find them uh, where the land is very salty next to the ocean, um, in places where it's very rocky or dry or the soil is weird like a serpentine barren. So a meadow that in a nice lush place like this has to experience some kind of ecological disturbance. So in order to keep the meadow a meadow, we have to disturb it. So we have to mow it, we have to burn it on a regular basis. You can do that annually. Um, if you want to have lots of grasses, um, and some species are, are better with the annual mowing, uh, or you can wait up to three years between mowing, but you need to keep an eye on those woody plants that are coming in. So we burn this meadow basically any one part of it every three years. Uh, we burn about one third of it each spring, usually in March. Um, if you look right across at the far area over there, we burn that to the ground in March. The plants there are very happy, including uh, the rarer fire-dependent grass that I mentioned. Um, so obviously most people should not try burning their own home meadow. Uh, it requires a lot of paperwork and a lot of coordination and a lot of training and everybody involved here at Longwood is fully certified to do so. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in that, there, there are people you can talk to, but uh, in general, most people are going to use mowing as their main tool. And you can do that annually. That is one of the nice things about a meadow is you don't need to mow it all the time. Uh, you just mow it once a year in most cases. You can use mowing as a tool to uh, treat problem plants. So you can mow little bits, you know, where you have a plant you don't want and then watch everything else grow back up. So you can use mowing to give also more diversity. You can 
instead of mowing everything at once, you can mow part. Uh, you can mow some plants and not others. You can get creative with how you shape the uh, diversity of your meadow. Dr. Johnson, can you tell us what are some of the challenges of keeping up with the meadow as we walk through this beautiful path of silphium here? Um, what are the things that gardeners have to consider? Well, weeds. A meadow is an early successional system. It's a place with a lot of sun, it's got open space. When you make those ecological disturbances, you're making opportunities for lots of plants that like a lot of sun to grow. And a lot of the plants that live in that kind of environment we know as weeds. So you need to know both your native plants and your weeds. And so that can be a fun learning challenge. Um, it's also a reason to start small. If you're if you're doing this from scratch and you're going to be doing it yourself, it's a good reason to start with the plants that you find most interesting to begin with and get to know what they look like when they're little. Get to know what the weeds that show up like you know, in your area look like when they're little too. Right, it's know your weeds <laughs> as well as your natives. The meadow garden is one of many beautiful gardens at Longwood. If you haven't been to Longwood, it's a world-class botanical garden. Um, one of the reasons I love working here is that I am a plant nerd, and it is a place where I get to interact with people who love plants in a lot of really different ways, from, you know, nursery propagation to bonsai, <laughs> as well as the talented people who work on my team who all love native plants as well. Longwood is well known for its expertise in many areas of horticulture, and people come here to see its many gardens that include annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and they also come and visit for its spectacular holiday displays. So when you're thinking about what plants to put in your meadow, an important consideration is that they offer value to wildlife as well as beauty for you all year round. So. In the early season, uh, you can get nectar value and pollen from plants like beard tongue, penstemon digitalis, uh, blue false indigo, baptisia australis, and golden alexanders, each of those offering lovely different colors. In the middle of the season, um, towards the beginning, the milkweeds, um, well, depending on the milkweed, which part of the middle of the season, but there are many species of milkweeds. Most people are aware that monarch butterflies love milkweeds. Uh, there are many of them. Uh, cup plant, Sylvian perfoliatum, is another good one for middle season. Uh, blazing star, Liatris spicata, which I think is just finishing in the meadow garden right now. Um, the many monardas, uh, monarda fistulosa with its hollow stems. Uh, late season, we start getting into that party of asters, um, New York ironweed, uh, Vernonia noviborosensis, goldenrods, joe pieweed, uh, black-eyed susans, the rudbeckias, um, and of course the native grasses, although their flowers are not quite as showy. Uh, in winter, that's when you really get into texture, So, uh, you, and you also have uh, value from those hollow-stemmed plants that we talked about. In the winter, everything is quiet, but the winter is really when you see um, beauty in the frost, beauty in the texture, um, beauty in the wind. It's really great when it snows, <laughs> if it snows. Gardeners across the country, the public, is waking up to the fact that we need to do something to protect our insects, to protect our birds, to conserve our soils, to conserve our wildlife. And a place like this will help us do that. There are so many goals that we need to achieve and changes that we need to make. Dr. Johnson, can you tell us a little bit about ecosystems and how you are supporting all kinds of wildlife here? This is a full-on ecosystem. We have, <laughs> we have the circle of life here. We have bunnies, we have foxes, uh, we have raptors, we have um, mice, you know, we have, we have all the things that like to live in a meadow. Um, and we're supporting all of that with plants, right? Prevent, plants are the base of our food chains. They are the base of the, the things that connect our food webs. They um, provide the food. So um, they provide food for a lot of different insects, uh, many specialist insects, and those 
insects go on to be food for a lot of other things. They are very high protein. So in the springtime, when all of the birds are feeding their young, that is when the caterpillars are out. And you know we all love to see the lovely moths and butterflies, but some of them do need to become food. Uh, and they become birds. So uh, we have great bird life here. Uh, the diversity of our habitats at Longwood uh, really reflects the diversity of our bird life as well. Right. And this is something that gardeners can do on their own property on a smaller scale. And the surprising thing is once you start doing it, you are going to be um, so magically transformed and want to get out there, want to see what is in your garden. You're going to see insects. You're going to see things that you've never seen before. Dr. Johnson has prepared some resources for you to use, which are available on Facebook. Um, you will find, if you go to Native Plant Channel's Facebook page, there you are going to find a list of resources uh, that include um, both books and other information online to help you get started with your meadow. Dr. Johnson, is there anything you would like us to, you know, before we leave today, what would you like us to remember? What, what would you like our gardeners to know? Well, when you're starting a meadow, start small, be patient, and enjoy the surprises. So thank you for watching Native Plant Channel. We've learned so much today. I'm so grateful to you, Dr. Johnson, for this tour, for educating everyone at home who wants to do something to protect our environment, um, to create better ecosystems, because we, we all know we need to do this. Um, our ecosystems are out of balance, and it's really up to us to make a difference in whatever way we can right in our backyard. So thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you to Longwood Gardens for having us here today. And happy gardening, everyone.